I am the Nerdy Apologist, and on this channel we use the tools of faith and reason to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is the fifth video in a series I am doing on Christian apologetics, so if you have not seen the previous videos, please check those out before continuing with this one. In the last couple of videos, I gave an argument both for the existence of God and for the divine attributes, such as omnipotence and omniscience. If you have accepted the argument that I gave, congratulations, you now accept classical theism. However, classical theism is not quite Christianity. If you recall from the first video I made, I am a classical apologist, which means that I use a two-step approach to defending Christianity. First theism, and then Christianity. Now that I have the first step out of the way, I will be spending the rest of this series on the second step. When I first started this series, I thought I would go directly from defending the argument for God's existence to giving an argument for the resurrection. However, there is a bit more that we can deduce from classical theism that can lead us to conclude that if any religion is the true religion, then Christianity is the best candidate. And that is what I will be doing in this video. First, we can rule out most religions that have existed throughout history, as most of them were polytheistic, and the gods that they believed in were not like the singular god of classical theism. Most of the gods in Greek mythology, for example, were capable of change and corruption, existed within time, had limits on their knowledge and power, were morally bankrupt, and not all-loving. They also weren't the ultimate cause of everything else that exists. The same can be said for the vast majority of other polytheistic religions. The only major exception to this that I could find is Hinduism, which although it has thousands of lesser deities, also has the concept of Brahman, which is the eternal, unchanging cause of all other things, a concept that sounds very much like the god of classical theism. Zoroastrianism is another religion that is consistent with classical theism, as it believes in a god who is unchanging, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. However, the religions that are definitely the most consistent with classical theism are, without a doubt, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. There are numerous verses from both the Bible and the Quran that can be used to demonstrate this. First, the most important thing we demonstrated about God, his defining aspect as it were, is that his essence is his existence. If you take into account that a thing's essence is what it is, and a thing's existence is that it is, we can say that God is that he is. In other words, if God were to speak of himself in the first person, he would say, I am that I am. Sound familiar? Exodus 3, 13 through 14. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. The New Testament affirms this as well, even ascribing this name to Jesus. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. The Quran, as far as I could find, does not use this name of God directly, but most of the great Islamic philosophers and theologians, such as Averroes and Avicenna, have said this of Allah. How about God being one? This is perhaps the most clearly stated doctrine in both the Bible and the Quran. Here are just a handful of verses. Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Ephesians 4, 4-6 There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. 1 Timothy 2, 5 For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Quran 38.65 Say, O Muhammad, I am only a warner, and there is not any deity except Allah, the One, the Prevailing. God being the cause of all other things? Genesis 1.1 In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Job 38.4 Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. 
2 Maccabees 7.23, Therefore the Creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of man and devised the origin of all things, will in his mercy and life give breath back to you again, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. John 1, 1 through 3 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Quran 36.81 Is not he who created the heavens and the earth able to create the likes of them? Yes, it is so, and he is the knowing creator. I could go on, but this video would take too long. If anyone's interested, I've linked a Google Doc in the description with more verses demonstrating the divine attributes. So, we are left with five major contenders. Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. How do we pick between them? Well, four out of these five make some claims about Jesus. Hinduism claims that Jesus was an avatar of Vishnu. Judaism claims that he was a false prophet who led Israel astray. Islam claims that he was a great prophet of Allah, although not as great a prophet as Muhammad. Christianity makes the most extraordinary claim of them all. Christians believe that Jesus is God himself, who took on a human nature to pay for our sins. And this is exactly what we would expect God to do, given classical theism. If you want a full-length treatment on this, I would recommend you check out a book by St. Anselm called Cordeus Homo, or why God became man. That's what I'm basing most of this argument on. First, we have established that God is all good, to be more precise, the source of all goodness, and that he is all loving, that is, he wills the good of all things. If God wills what is good for us, and God is the source of all goodness, it follows that God wills for us to seek him so that he can give us what is good. Our last end, therefore, that which ultimately is best for us, is God. Furthermore, God cannot will that which goes against his will, as that would be a contradiction. God cannot, therefore, will for us to contradict his will by doing evil, but must will for us to do always and only what is good. In other words, God prescribes or binds us to do what is right. This is, in the classical theist's view, the source of morality. But now we have a problem. How well have you lived up to that standard? I'll be the first to admit that I've done a very lousy job at it. And if you're being honest, I think you will too. We have all done things that we know are wrong, and many times we have made excuses for it. We've all hurt people. We've all done evil. Furthermore, even when we try to do what is good, we often fail. This is what, in Christian theology, is meant by the term original sin, and it is a horrific problem. If you don't yet realize just how horrific of a problem it is, consider that whenever we do wrong to someone, we owe them a certain degree of satisfaction. To really hammer this point home, let's consider some extreme evil acts. Consider murder, for example. Imagine that someone brutally murdered the person you care about the most. Now let's suppose that once the police find this someone, they just tell them, hey, don't do that again, and they just let the person go free. Wouldn't you say that's unjust, that at least some satisfaction has to be paid, preferably life in prison, or even death? How about some of the extremely awful acts described in Inspiring Philosophy's video on the problem of evil? Wouldn't you say that the people that committed those acts need to pay satisfaction for them? Now consider the fact that you are capable of committing those same evil acts, and are complicit in many of them, as pointed out in that same video. But even if you hadn't done anything that evil, even if your sins were only relatively minor sins, it would still be horrific. Remember that God is infinite goodness, and our existence at each moment is wholly contingent on him. God then has an infinite right to our obedience to his will, which is to avoid evil. When we know what is good and directly will the opposite by sinning, therefore, we are dishonoring an infinite being. 
Even in sins against others, such as theft, we are also sinning against God, and thereby dishonoring an infinite being. Furthermore, we are honoring an infinite being that freely willed our existence. Thus, every time we sin, we have to pay an infinite satisfaction for our sin before we can ever come into full union with God, which is our ultimate end. But being finite creatures, we cannot pay this satisfaction except over an infinite amount of time. We are thus depriving ourselves of all eternity of union with God. As C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity, we have cause to be uneasy. Quote, the moral law does not give us any grounds for thinking that God is good in the sense of being indulgent or soft or sympathetic. There is nothing indulgent about the moral law. It is as hard as nails. It tells you to do the straight thing and it does not seem to care how painful or dangerous or difficult it is to do. If God is like the moral law, then he is not soft. We know that if there does exist an absolute goodness, it must hate most of what we do. This is the terrible fix we are in. I wish it was possible to say something more agreeable, but I must say what I think is true. Of course, I quite agree that the Christian religion is, in the long run, a thing of unspeakable comfort. But it does not begin in comfort. It begins in the dismay I have been describing, and it is no use at all trying to go on to that comfort without first going through that dismay." Unquote. So we are, by nature, destined for communion with God, and we have also chosen to break that communion with God, with the only way out being to pay an infinite satisfaction, which we cannot pay. God is merciful, this follows directly from his goodness, so he should wish for us to come back into communion with him. However, God is also just, this also follows from his goodness, so he should still require the infinite satisfaction to be paid, as to simply remit that would be unjust. Nevertheless, only an infinite being such as God could pay this satisfaction. So if God wants to redeem us, how would he do so? It would be incredibly fitting for God to assume a human nature and to pay, as a man, the infinite satisfaction that none of us can pay on our own. Now, it would also be fitting that, once God receives the satisfaction, that he should give a reward. But, he can't give this reward to himself, because to give a reward involves adding some type of perfection, and God, being already perfect, cannot be perfected. This reward must, therefore, be given to someone else, and it would be fitting for God to bestow that reward upon the very people he wants to save, namely us. This is the heart of the gospel. God became man to pay the debt that we could not pay, and thereby restore us to union with him. Much more could be said on this topic, and perhaps I will make more videos in the future that discuss this in more detail, but for now it suffices to say that it would be fitting for God to become man. Only one religion has this as its central tenet, and that is Christianity. Note that this is not a direct argument for the truth of Christianity, but it does say that if any one of the world's religions is right, the Christian religion is the best candidate. If we want to investigate the religions of the world, I know of no better place to start than to investigate the man whom Christians believe God became, Jesus of Nazareth. That is what I will start to do in the next video. God bless.